Why is the shopping cart always in the top right of the screen? How do companies predict my purchases? Why do prices end in nine? Why do fast food companies use red and yellow in their logos? Why do restaurants always have one expensive menu item? Researchers, marketers, and very curious people seek the answers for how we make decisions and how we choose products. Click Suasion finds the secrets that companies use and shares them with you. Why do I feel better when I bought the last remaining airline ticket? How do I make choices based on colors and fonts? Welcome, everybody. This is a very special meeting of the Behavioral Economics NYC Meetup. Uh, I'm Brett Weisel, and I'm going to be your temporarily uh, unintroverted MC for tonight. Uh, not sure how long that'll last because I did like networking all day today. So, so we'll see. So, a few quick words about our meetup. Uh, our mission of the Behavioral Economics NYC Meetup is to welcome everybody with interest in behavioral economics to gather and learn about the theory and app practical applications in an accessible and free format. Uh, ground rules are a respectful and thoughtful dialogue. We clean up after ourselves. We change our RSVP if we're not going to show, and I think we're really uh, unusually good about that. Uh, tonight's format is kind of an experiment, so thanks in advance for your patience. If it explodes, I don't think it will. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, so let's get started. Uh, our event is tonight is about applying behavioral economics to an important problem facing our community in many cities and towns across the developed world. So landholders have been slow, we'll learn more about this, to participate in subsidized programs to build green roofs and other green infrastructure that could reduce the overflow of sewage in rivers and lakes when it rains. So tonight we're going to brainstorm some ideas to fix this problem. And our host, our host, the Nature Conservancy will, will take the best of these ideas and work to implement them. That's pretty cool, right? I, I think it's pretty awesome. Yes, yes, it's really, yes. This is being recorded, folks, so yes. Okay, okay, so here's how it's gonna work, just really quickly. Uh, first, uh, Nina Chen of the Conservancy will give us a brief introduction to the design challenge. Our expert panel here, whom I will introduce shortly, will briefly share their observations, analysis, and suggestions to help you all meet that challenge. At about 8 o'clock, it'll be brainstorming time. We'll give you a few minutes to ideate on your own. You'll gather into your assigned groups. There's a little box on the top, upper right corner of your instructions. That's your group. Um, you'll have, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or so until 8.30 to, to come up with some great ideas. You'll designate a, a uh, spokesperson. You'll come back. You'll um, the spokesperson will explain your brilliant ideas. The Nature Conservancy will, or will um, consult with the panel, designate a winner, uh, a winner um, confer some fabulous prizes. I'll have some brief closing remarks at the end. So, any questions? No. Totally confusing? <laughs> I'm confused. Okay. All right, so let's start. So, so let's get started. So let me introduce um, Nina Chen. Right on the left, she's uh, director of conservation investments at the New York division of the Nature Conservancy. She's responsible for leveraging and creating the enabling conditions for private capital and innovation finance to accelerate and scale up conservation impacts in New York. Uh, she focuses on healthy cities, climate resilient infrastructure, and climate mitigation. Please welcome Nina. Yes. Okay. So, so please tell us about yeah. please tell us about the challenge you have for us tonight. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming tonight and uh, spending time with us. Um, let's just show a uh, show of hands. Anybody who, um, likes raw sewage in your rivers and lakes? <laughs> Nobody. We don't like that either. But unfortunately. In many cities around the country, including New York City, Buffalo, in these old cities, uh, we're still using a technology that was invented by the Roman. The 3,000-year-old technology called combined sewer systems. And what it does is, when we rain, uh, first, obviously, it collects the raw sewage from your homes, offices, and so on, and convey that to, um, to the wastewater treatment plant. And at the same time, the same system also collects 
rainwater or snow melts and convey, we, we call that storm water once it falls onto the impervious surface like roads, parking lots, and then also convey that to wastewater treatment plant. So it's combined. In newer cities, these two systems are separated. The beauty of the combined system is that you don't have water that's from the roads that pick up the, uh, the dirty chemicals or the oil waste. Or, um, it's get treat it gets treated before it flows into the rivers and lakes. And the downside of that is our cities have always outgrown what our wastewater treatment plants have designed to build. So when it rains, and in places it might just be one inch of rain, the system overflows, and then you have the dirty stuff that we don't want to see going into our water. EPA has uh, strong regulations against that, and the way many cities are doing their best to treat this, to avoid that. So the traditional design is building giant tanks and tunnels underground to hold the stormwater uh, until it stops raining and then gradually release that to the wastewater treatment plant. The problem with that is extremely costly. It costs billions of dollars. And you also don't, like from a citizen's perspective, you don't really see that much benefit except for no sewage in the water, in rivers, which is important. There's an alternative, which is uh, some examples as shown here. I still, this uh, picture from Georgetown University. Um, is we can use nature or nature-based solutions, or we call green infrastructure in relationship to gray, to capture and treat the water where it falls. So imagine just city roofs in Manhattan. If they were all covered by green, by sedums, plants, then we will be able to avoid tons and tons of stormwater going into our combined systems and uh, re greatly reduce that overflow. So city is actually paying property owners to host a green infrastructure like this. At the same time, the uptake is fairly, can be fairly low. So as an example, New York City, very wealthy, we, um, the city has set aside $500 million to pay private property owners to host these green infrastructure. It will cover the design, construction costs. And over the past five years, they were only able to commit 15, one five million. Just because the programs are, there are many challenges. And some of them are listed in your uh, handouts. And I want to flag that um, <clears throat> many of you who are, are familiar with um, behavior economics are probably used to uh, problems that trying to influence uh, actions that many people take uh, on a daily basis or uh, over many times, like how do you get people to brush their teeth more or, or save more for their um, retirement? This is somewhat different. Obviously, we could, <clears throat> um, there are, say, individual homeowners, if you have a backyard, you can, you can do like this uh, downspout disconnect at the bottom uh, left-hand side. But for the biggest bang for the buck, for the lowest cost per acre, um, it's usually the larger uh, properties that are most useful. Like if you have a, a big green roof or if you have a large, uh, um, say, parking lot that can be converted, that, um, that uh, where the stormwater on the parking lot can be converted, uh, treated. So these decisions are made by a few people, say like the top 10 uh, developers in the city, and these are very deliberate decisions. So that's the context. Um, and you can read more on the challenges, like the specific challenges, like the, sometimes the programs are not very user-friendly, like it's, 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 it can be cumbersome for the application process, um, and uh, sometimes developers might think, oh, it's going to slow down my, uh, my construction schedule if I add these new components. Sometimes their stormwater engineers are not familiar with this uh, new, it's relatively new, maybe like 10 years, um, uh, these green infrastructure um, designs. So yeah, so what can we do? And I'm advising um, the city of Buffalo 
on how to design their next generation of green infrastructure program. I just had a call with the program manager early this afternoon and talked about actually tonight. And he was very excited that we'll hopefully get some really cool ideas. So I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, so, so I'm going to just quickly uh, introduce the panel and then we'll go from my right to, to left with like maybe two or three minutes observations, ideas, suggestions, um, however you like. So, so I'll just do introductions first. So, so first here is Annie Duke. Uh, she's an author, professional speaker, decision strategist, philanthropist, and most importantly, previous behavioral economics NYC speaker. Yeah. Uh, her latest book, Thinking in Bets, is literally a game changer. I loved it. I recommend it. Um, I think there's some for the winners. There are. Yeah. Are yeah. So bonus. Um, she's an MA in uh, cognitive psychology from Penn. Uh, to her left is Carolyn Bauer. She's a the uh, manager of the service design studio at the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, where she works with nonprofits, city agencies, and design firms on projects in the built environment. She's a certified urban planner, uh, with a master's in urban planning from Columbia. Uh, to her left is uh, uh, Liz, or Liz, okay, Liz Smith. She's a lead the lead scientist in social, uh, si of social science and economics for the New York Division of the Nature Conservancy and is a multidimensional explorer of the people-nature connection at the intersection of infrastructure, community resilience, and policy. All the bios tonight, I have to take like multiple breaths to get through. Uh, she has a PhD in environmental and natural resource economics. And then we have uh, Aaron Sherman, who's a uh, newly minted VP, congratulations, at uh, Ideas42, where she focuses on civic engagement and incorporating resilience, adaptation, and environmental justice perspectives into environmental work. She did a, um, a degree in psychology, a certificate in environmental studies from Princeton. So let's welcome our panelists. And, okay, so one by one. So Annie, what, what are your thoughts? Okay, uh, so I'll just I'll just quickly say as you're sort of thinking about it, I think that one of the we tend to think about sort of the the things that we might do versus the things that we don't do. So I would encourage you not just to think about say nudges, but think about sludge as well. I think that sludge is really important. So What's sludge. That? So sludge is the opposite of a nudge. It's something which creates friction between the person actually executing something. So for example, there's there's a lot of data from India that shows they have they have like this really great free healthcare in India that's available for, uh, particularly for widows. Um, but the paperwork is like ridiculous. So it's a free thing. I mean, like here, the city is going to give you something free. They're going to put this pretty thing on your roof. Um, so in India, they'll give you this free health care, but people really don't take advantage of it because there's too much sludge. So uh, another example of sludge would be voter ID laws as a way to create sludge, mm -hmm. right? So it's just like some sort of barrier that doesn't, like you got something free coming to you. You don't have to pay for it. It's just you sort of have to pay with the stuff that you have to do. So I, I would just like, as you're thinking about solutions, don't just think about how do you encourage people to do it, but how do you not discourage people from doing something by creating friction between the thing you want them to do and the, the, the them. So that would be my two cents. So about removing barriers? It's a set, yeah, it's like you can think okay. about, it, it's a way that you, and a lot of times it's unintentional that the, that the barriers is raised, like just filling out a form is a little bit sludgy, right? So um, if, if, I, if to do something, I have to be able to bring my birth certificate. Right, and maybe I just don't have a birth certificate at home. So now I have to get this paperwork and I have to come and do this. And even though you're making me a free thing, I don't do it because I got to go do this other thing. So it's how, how do we make sure that we're, we don't have unintentional barriers um, in the process that, that, and sometimes they're done intentionally. I just want to say that, but um, I assume in this case, the barriers are probably unintentional. So I would just think about that. I love the idea of sludge. I'm going to borrow that. I feel like my whole job is fighting sludge. There you go. Please <laughs> use sludge. It's not Your my obviously. thing, by the way. Like Thaler uses it a lot, and I didn't. I didn't make that word up. I just want to make it clear that I give credit to the Nobel Prize winner. Well, tonight you get the credit for it. <laughs> um, sort of building off of that idea, I would think about somebody's entire journey of 
putting up a green infrastructure system, what's going to entice them, what's going to continue to engage them, and then what if they want to exit? Think about all pieces of that puzzle. I think that's a lot of times programs roll out without thinking about uh, a holistic solution. I also want to emphasize that um, if we're focusing on big private developers, maybe since we live in a city where diversity is the health of the city, we should be thinking about other scales of property owners and other kinds of um, non-residential condo establishments. Uh, that might be... Yeah, I want to clarify that it's not just uh, developers, even though they are like, the easier example to give, but also large institutions or churches. And uh, definitely for um, in thinking about diversity and inclusion, um, the smaller scales, uh, sm like in your backyard, you can put things up like that, which, which also um, is very valuable. And at the same time, with limited resources for the biggest bang for the buck from like the sewer authorities' perspective, focusing on, well, actually, I think uh, it's easier to use nudge for the smaller, like hundreds, like 10,000 homeowners. I think it's harder for the, say, the 50 largest landowners in a city. So that's why I picked the large landowners to give you that challenge. Oh, okay. So it's actually harder for the bigger developers to do this type of work because well, I, of the uh, scale? I, my limited understanding for behavior economics or behavior science, I think it's harder to nudge them mm, because okay. these are very deliberate, like $100,000 jobs or projects. Mm -hmm. It's not like a $10 that you can Tank nudge. in your backyard, yeah. Right. So how, how can we apply behavior science to this kind of big projects, big decisions? Yeah. I think oftentimes, uh, sometimes policies are thought through the eyes of larger developers or larger influencers. Um, and so I think there's real power in thinking about the smaller actors. Uh, so I would encourage people to think through that lens. So I guess to sum it up, think about diversity and of scale and think about the entire journey. I love this. It's fun being in the middle. Um, Nina, I want to clarify, there isn't a specific audience. It's not just big developers only. No. Okay. Um, I'm not going to make you say more. Um, so I had the good fortune of being at the Behavioral Summit today. And if you don't know what that is, you should Google it. It's worth it's worth checking out. But what I heard over and over again, like my big takeaway was audience, decision, barrier. So who's your audience? What's the decision they have to make? And what are the barriers that they face? Just setting up a conceptual frame to think through what those decisions might be, and then figuring out as what stands in their way, what are the levers or what's the behavioral science say that we can we might be able to lean in on, when whether that's nudges or financial incentives or social norms or providing more knowledge. What we have seen over and over again is that it is often not only one lever or framework that works. So yes to financial incentives, but what about um, what about social norms? I worked on, so in a more ac applied academic sense, working with how we got farmers to change decisions about um, harvesting their crops to let little birds um, have, their, have their spawning season. And it was interesting because we had communities buying in to auctions to help pay off these farmers, but people got stickers of these little birds, little bobolinks, if you know what little bobolinks are. They're these pretty yellow and black birds. And so there were communities up in New England where all these folks have these stickers on their cars. And it became this identity, like a social identity, where people would be beeping at each other as they're going down the block, like, hey, you've got the sticker. And so it's just another, do I think that is the only mechanism? No. Um, but there are many to think about, and you might want to think about many at once. Great. Um, a lot has been said already. Um, I wanted to double down on make it easy, remove friction and sludge for sure. Um, and that works especially well if you think folks' intentions are good. Like they really like the idea of installing this infrastructure, but the sludge is like getting in their way, uh, making them procrastinate or get hung up on a step. What do you do if people don't already have this intention 
or this sort of affinity for this action. Um, especially if you're talking about businesses, that's kind of uh, a spot that behavioral economics doesn't yet have a lot to say about that. Um, I would think about a few different principles that we, we think about in the individual nudging space that um, are sort of positively framed and how they might apply to businesses. So how would installing this infrastructure reflect on an identity of the property owner or make them feel pride or make their employees feel pride? Um, and what would it do for their reputation? Speaking a bit to the, the idea of a social norm. Um, norms. What do I mean by identity? A lot, maybe. But um, so people like to reflect on themselves positively, right? We all like to, at the end of the day, sort of feel good about ourselves. And the groups to whom we belong or the social signals we put out can help us feel that positive identity. And one of the kind of magic things about identity that many types of nudges don't really get you is that one good action begets another. We feel motivated to remain consistent with an identity we've expressed in the past. So if we do something and we're paid for it, we might think, I did it for the money. If we do something and we are either paid a trivial amount or weren't paid at all, we will make up a story about how we are the kind of person who does that um, through the process of cognitive dissonance or another theory, depending on what you subscribe to. But long story short, if you can encourage someone to see themselves a certain way and then encourage them to double down on that identity, sometimes it can get you places that more financial incentives cannot. Can I, I just want to add one thing from what, what you guys said. Don't just think about how to encourage the business owner. Because sometimes you can just imagine the business owner is like, I just want to make the most money. So you might want to focus on a smaller unit, which is the people who are going to consume whatever the business owner is offering. So you might be able to kind of ignore the owner of the building and think about the people who are going to be occupants of the building. Because if they demand that if they're, they're willing to pay a premium, for example, for a building that has this, or they won't go, they, they prefer to be in buildings that have it or whatever, then, you know, eventually then there's a market for organic food because people want it. Um, so it's so just another way to think about it. Don't necessarily think about it as top down. Also think about it as bottom up. Okay. We, have we actually have time for maybe one or two quick questions for the panel. Um, regarding the product offerings, I see that there's different versions up there as we think about sort of the choice architect architecture that we present to the buyers during the buying process. I could see something potentially happening in terms of the grades or tiers as it relates to investment. Can you speak just to some of the solutions up there really briefly? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And just to make it harder for you, um, let's not look at the simply solution, which is a downspout uh, disconnect or a rain barrel. Um, but look at the bigger ones like a green roof or uh, converting part of, say, the parking uh, a parking spot into a biosway like the top right. You can also do um, um, like imp a pervious pavement like the bottom right. And these uh, tend to be above 10,000 to $1 million projects. And uh, also, uh, New York City is not really the right landscape to think about it because we have so limited uh, space, um, but more thinking like Queens or like Buffalo where you, you do have more um, on the ground space where you can put in this. Any more burning questions before we break up? Yes. Um, I understand that there was legislation proposed to make this a mandate that developers and anyone doing significant work on their roof would have to do this. I was just wondering, I, I don't really know if that's still in process, if anyone has an update on that. And then, Yeah, actually, so the green roof legislation is uh, just for New York City, while many places like Buffalo does not have a um, pending legislation like that. So that what many cities do is uh, they will pay for the design construction of the project while still the uptake is fairly low. Um, so if, uh, also think about Buffalo, like for example, it's a city that's not experiencing a whole lot of new development or redevelopment. So you are most likely it will be retrofitting existing uh, 
properties. All right, so now, now it's time to, to kind of hear what you all came up with. All right, so for group one, um, we felt like awareness was a big barrier for folks understanding the tax abatement program and the grant program and awareness around the CSO problem. I don't think everyone in the city yet understands the severity of the CSO problem and the amount of sewage in our waterways. So certainly education and outreach programs would have to be part of building awareness of the uh, reason for all of us getting involved in uh, managing stormwater better. So education is certainly one part of it. Um, and then we also felt like the programs themselves need some adjustments. Um, the tax abatement program doesn't yet uh, fully cover the costs that someone actually <laughs> incurs when they put a green roof on their building. And so the legislation that is being proposed right now by, I think, Levin and another uh, council member is suggesting that that price that for the rebate uh, be increased from $4.50 per square foot, which is what it is now, to $15 per square foot. Uh, that's what they feel the threshold is for people to, for the taxpayers to agree to this rebate program. So um, certainly the tax abatement program needs to be improved. With the grant program, there is a lot of sludge. I love that I've learned a new word tonight and I get to use it this way. But uh, the paperwork is extremely complicated. Um, the grant, they call it a grant program, but the person installing the green roof has to pay out first. They get reimbursed for their expenses. And so I think there's some fear and anxiety around, you know, will I actually get reimbursed? What does this process look like? So one of the recommendations that we had for that was to have a facilitator who is someone that comes in and sits down with the building owner or the property owner or the developer, whomever it may be, who's going to apply for this grant, help them get the paperwork filled out so that it's just as easy as possible. And then another thing that we thought about was with the grant program that some of the monies certainly are going to go to cover the cost to install the roof, but uh, the green roof or the value of swale or rain garden, whatever whatever the idea is that the person wants to accomplish. But then also some of those grant monies goes to um, maintenance, because maintenance is such a big barrier. Nice job. Hey, so uh, I've done lightning talks, but never two and a half minutes. Let's see. We had a long list of ideas, so I'll, um, there's no time to explain. I'll sum up borrow from a movie. Anybody get the reference? No. <laughs> anyway. Um, so we, we really took the idea of sludge to heart and frictionless, and that ran as a thread through a lot of the ideas. Uh, and some of the key ones that came out were a facilitator to help with the paperwork, but also we talked about targeted outreach, um, especially for high value properties or, or things that were, were, would be a big capture like uh, large land owners something like Columbia University, talk to them about their properties. Uh, full disclosure, I work for Columbia, so <laughs> kind of axe to grind there. But um, we also talked about uh, providing either turnkey solutions, you know, scaled right GI solutions that are essentially sold. So you've got a roof this size, you can put this type of bioswale, and here's the nice pretty picture that makes it, shows how it's going to look better than your existing roof. Uh, and the case studies that quantify, you know, increases in rent or whatever like that. Some of those apparently exist and uh, providing access for those would be quite useful. Um, refer to my notes. What else do we have? Um, oh, right, certification. So some, especially larger companies are looking for lead certification or other environmental certification. So you can get the green roof badge and that can be credit towards lead certification or other environmental certifications. So that makes a lot of sense. And then we had, um, yeah, the opt in versus opt out, right? So right now it's very difficult to opt in. This was uh, a good suggestion on, even if it's at the building level where the developers already tried to do it, but the residents have to buy in, you know, 
if you opt in, you just have to sign. If you want to opt out, if you want to object, then you have to fill out the paperwork and explain why you should not do the green roof. So the default being a green roof in a new development or, or a building that wants to approve it. Yeah. That's, I think, did I miss anything, Big? I think that's good. Cool. Thanks. Good job. So I'm going to talk quickly. Um, our, we wanted to really come up with a behavioral strategy. So um, we really thought about it in three parts. Number one is the awareness issue. So how do we create salience through the right timing of the message, the messenger, for example. Um, the second part is really the, the kind of the content of the message, like why, how do we reframe it? And the third part is really around the choice architect, so architecture where I'm ready to, I'm ready to commit, but just make it easy for me or... Um, convincing. So the first part was um, it has to be timed around when people do budgeting. When this is a really big ticket item, this is not something they're going to do outside of a budgeting process. So how do we target condo boards when they're doing their budgeting or when developers do their budgeting and time it then? Um, can we target like number one seated properties within a particular neighborhood where they become kind of the influencer for the neighborhood. People want to be like them um, and to kind of use that influence for other people to uh, follow. And, and with that, they could talk about the benefits of how their property value increased. And so there's a benefit for the whole neighborhood and, and individual properties. Um, we, talk, we talked a bit about a messenger. Um, who's, who's really going to these people and talking about it? Is it, um, I mean, you could have like a Leonardo DiCaprio if, you know, who's, who, wants, who doesn't want to listen to him, um, but think about who's delivering the message. Um, how can we use landscapers? Because they go in, they do their spring budget. Um, they're already planning this. There could be a, a benefit or incentive for them um, putting this in. It could be something that becomes a default um, within their, uh, in their, 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 I can't think of it, <laughs> when they give you the options for when you want to buy. Um, also, if you're at the local uh, park and you can have a sign that says, this lake was uh, contaminated by 5% by um, raw sewage. And that becomes the, oh my gosh, I have to do something about it. The, okay, then the content. Um, how do we reframe the value? So you can use these green areas for your dogs, meditation, herb gardens. Um, how do you tie like a sustainability rating around it? So um, my property, uh, if we do this, it means I am green. It's kind of a must have feature. So every building wants to have this. Um, that's also kind of around social norms. You don't want to be left out. Um, how do you frame the benefit from a taxpayer? So taxpayers, you're paying X amount of money for cleaning up the raw sewage. By adopting this, you won't have that. And then there were some choice architecture things that we can do, but we don't have time, so. All right, so a lot of what we talked about has already been kind of covered, but I'll touch on some of the stuff that hasn't. Got this super high fidelity visual for you to look at while I'm talking. Um, so yeah, we talked a lot about incentives, a lot about social norms. The one part that I'll add in that I haven't heard yet because I've seen projects like this coming out of Pittsburgh and Portland and stuff like that is the actual like leveraging of open data portals by actually like putting sensors and high fidelity cameras and like in existing green infrastructure to sort of start tracking and getting visualizations out there whether that's through like actual research institutions or like private companies that can help with providing visualization of like what actually happens when storms and people and stuff goes through these actual this actual infrastructure, which we haven't really talked a lot about what actually happens when this stuff is in place or like how it actually improves the landscape. So providing visualiz visualizations on that, as well as like external scales, um, like on Zillow or like something similar to Yelp that would actually provide negative like feedback on buildings that like weren't doing this. So for like tenants that were looking for like a new apartment, can you go on Zillow and see that like this building that you're looking at has like a two out of five like green rating or something. Um, so kind of like providing the certifications like you're talking about, but also kind of the negative like reputational aspects that can kind of get baked in. In addition to um, kind of like tiered levels of certification, thank you so much for holding this by the way, it's like really hero, um, where you have kind of like incentives bundled together. So like landowners can pick sort of like a tier. Okay, can I create like a little green infrastructure and get like a little bit of benefit or like a level two and get more like benefit um, if you're like can eventually get payoffs for for the 
um, like higher level payoffs, like tax cuts or something like that, like further down the line that maybe you can bundle it together into, okay, now you have to make a commitment to create like even more infrastructure. So yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. Hi, group five here. Um, we have what's sort of written back here on the board. I won't go into too much detail about it. There've already been a lot of really good suggestions thrown out there, obviously. Um, you know, we realized right away, as I think most groups did, that this is a really hard problem. And pretty much no matter what path you follow down, there's going to be plenty of reasons uh, to say that it won't work. But ultimately, we kind of decided to focus on what we could do with developers who are, or, or those who are in control of the large amounts of land. We looked at what drives the profit that they have, right? The biggest incentive that they're likely to have when it comes to making any decision, especially on this scale. Um, what we focus a lot on is like how cheap or how easy can we make this change for them? How can we lower the cost in terms of dollars? And how can we lower the cost in terms of time and get rid of the sludge so that it's easier? One thing that we did come up with on that side or that we focused on was working with the partners on both the construction and the maintenance side. So who is it that they're ultimately going to be working with and in what way can they, um, can we have them help themselves to find these building owners uh, proactively and work with them and get them to convince uh, that this is you know, beneficial for all sides. Meanwhile, though, on the, on the more revenue side, how is it that these owners are getting their money, they're being paid by individuals living within or signing leases within these buildings. So how can we start then a grassroots movement, uh, you know, pun intended, to get people from the inside to push up and say that we want this change. And ultimately what we thought was the most unique and, and possibly viable solu uh, solution is to find key individuals in these buildings that are really passionate about this. So who are the people that we can go to on the inside who can then be the champions from within and who we can arm with all of these other ideas that we've gotten throughout the night and push them on their own to the others living in or inhabiting the building? Excellent. Great job. Okay, so, so we got... Um, Group one with uh, education, outreach, um, uh, facilitators. Group two with also outreach and facilitators, but you know, looking at lead certifications and, and the, kind of the, the opt-out idea. Group three with uh, kind of a kitchen sink sort of um, <laughs> everything in, um, in the nudge book. Um, uh, group four with a, um, no, we do salience and uh, a content choice architecture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, group four with the uh, open data and visualizations and uh, negative feedback or maybe a certification. And then group five with um, you know ways to lower the cost and time by working with the right people and finding champions in each building. So it's now time for Nina and Jen at the uh, Nature Conservancy to consult with our panel of experts. So which which team? has provided the most useful and original and actionable suggestions that uh, you all can take in, in your work to get more people, um, to help the city get more people to um, take up on this opportunity. Yeah, so we heard a lot of great uh, ideas uh, from all the five teams and really grateful for being here. Um, also, thank all the panelists and thank Brad, Mike, uh, Noreen for organizing this whole thing. Um, so after much discussion, we decided to pick um, team four. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a hard decision. There were, there were just a lot of good ideas and uh, um, we appreciated the um, talked about incentives and so on. But also um, the idea of integrating Zillow with uh, the features with Zillow, uh, having like high fidelity cameras to show things and have different uh, tiers of incentives that people can choose from. Um, so I think, yeah, these are great things to think about. And um, and I still I want to say that there are other teams like Team Three has the, a lot of the good ideas that we also want to incorporate them. And obviously, rules and regulations is uh, a hugely important, and paying the full cost, obviously, is still hugely important. Um, 
and there are times when you pay the full cost, the people are still not coming. So that's really what we are trying to solve for, um, for hearing from you. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Jennifer Chin. I'm the Director of Conservation Innovation here in uh, the New York chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And we just wanted to thank you again for being here today and offering all of your expertise and ideas to this project. If for whatever reason you want to continue to be involved in our work on stormwater um, or have anything else that you would like to offer to us, we're always open to hearing your advice and we hope that this will be the first of um, many other events where we can invite the public into our space to help us sort of co-design these solutions to the problems that we know are very, very pressing for our planet today. So thank you so much for being here and um, thank you again to the Behavioral Economics Meetup for everything that you've done and for really diving into this with us. It's been great. And thank you especially to our panelists who have very graciously given us their time today and their expertise. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Clicksuasion. Subscribe to the podcast, read our research, and get in touch with us at clicksuasion.com. You can also find us on Twitter with the handle at Clicksuasion.